I always say, uh, and brother, uh, you pastor uh, kind of mentioned this to me about a week and a half ago, and as uh, brother Joe said, especially coming here, you just don't want some bagged sermon and you want to give you something good. And I, uh, it's, it's a lengthy process. You have to sit there and meditate and ponder and search out the scriptures and and then I think, oh, I hope I have enough material. And so I always tell myself, I don't perceive myself being long, which is a little mental trick I play on myself because then it makes me relax and then I get long-winded. So you don't know what you're going to get. I try to get you out of here at 12 o'clock. Uh, Matthew chapter 7. Uh, last week as we, uh, I came in on the tail end of the service, um, it, Brother Tucker, uh, Pastor, uh, invited me over to his house just to chit-chat a little bit. I think that was 3 o'clock, and before I knew it, the sun was down, and uh, it was like 9 o'clock, you know. <laughs> and I'm wandering out of there. He, he uh, offered to give me instructions. I said, don't worry about it. I got my cell phone with me. I'll just Google it, and uh, I'll be good to go. We got down the driveway, and asked uh, Google to navigate me home, no internet connection. And uh, I wandered around in the darkness for a while. <laughs> I eventually hit Northfield Road. I said, okay, Northfield Road, I should be able to find it here. Went back to old-fashioned methods. Stop at the gas station and ask for directions. <laughs> it, works, uh, it worked like a charm. I made it home. But uh, as we were there, uh, we were discussing uh, one of the many things we discussed was uh, the simplicity in Christ, you know. And I finally got that way in my uh, walk with the Lord, I believe, um, enjoying that, the simplicity in Christ, you know. Uh, when I first got saved, as I mentioned in the uh, morning uh, Bible lesson, that, you know, I was always into reading all these books and commentaries about, you know, what this guy thought and this guy thought. And, I got tons of books at home, and now they're kind of collecting dust on the shelf, and I just like reading the Bible, and what does the Bible say, you know? Keep it simple. And uh, also in my walk with the Lord, you know, uh, I want to present what I think is really kind of just getting back to basics, keep it simple, but the title of my message would be uh, The Most Horrible Words You Could Possibly Hear, and for that, we will go to... Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Why? Those are some horrifying words. I mean, just horrifying. And uh, well, let us have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the message. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that. You would give me the words to say, although I have studied and, and pondered and, and wrote down notes, I pray, dear God, you'd give me liberty and that you'd keep me from saying anything you'd have me not to say. Say only those things which would be what you want to accomplish, Lord. I pray, dear God, that it'd be edifying to the hear and encouraging, but also that it would be admonishing, Lord. And I preach this message mostly to myself, so I pray, dear God, that you'd bless it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we look here in our text, we see that the people that the Lord is speaking to are those who acknowledge Him as Lord. In fact, there's a, a double emphasis there. It's Lord, Lord, you know. So they know Jesus and would be saying that He is my Lord. Okay, and also, I find it interesting that they say, have we not prophesied in thy name? So these are just, these are people who would say, hey, I'm a Christian. Also, they've done works like casting out demons and add on there many wonderful works. 
And so, in my own life, I sit there and like, a, when it comes to studying the Bible, I, I just want to examine the scriptures. What do the scriptures say? Not what some commentator, not that I'm opposed to going to commentaries, but really like examining what do the scriptures say? And then when it comes to myself, I want to examine myself. In fact, that would say be the purpose of this sermon is to get us all to examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own self, how, the, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. As the psalmist said, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. That is to be our heart's prayer. And as I look at my own self, and there are times, I, I would say this, think this to myself. Am I really saved? And, and it's a mind-boggling. And I, I mean, I've been saved now for 28 years, since 19, well, yeah, 1991. Do the math, though, real quick. And uh, a dramatic change came into my life the moment I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I, I often say when I used to preach down at the city mission, you know, I was, one day I was this beer guzzling, pot smoking, foul mouth, wicked sinner, and the Lord transformed my life, which he did. Uh, but now, you know, I'm almost been saved half of my life. I'm getting there. I got saved at 30, yeah, uh, 28, 29 years. Saved half of my life. I got saved at 30, and next August 11th, I'll be 60 years old. And sometimes, well, apathy sets in, complacency, even indifference. Uh, there are some things I just cannot do anymore. Not that they're wrong, but to help me. To help me from becoming apathetic or indifferent or even angry at things. For instance, I've given up on watching the news. I don't care. <laughs> it's, you know, it's like it's always it's the same story. It's rehashed every day. It's same story, different faces, different names, different places. Same story. Uh, I think the the uh, the pinnacle of when I finally quit watching. TV and the news and all that, and you do what you want, but for me, it just, it is just, it just causes too much anger, and this is why. I called up the TV station after they reported something, and I said, hey, you want to know who the real terrorists are? It's you. <laughs> You're constantly striking fear and terror and horror in everybody's hearts, you know, so I, I gave up on that for my own sake, so I can keep focused on the Lord. Um, the cares of this world. You know the Bible says that. The cares and riches of this world choke the word that you become unfruitful. And I, I, I have to confess that too. I mean, I'm working two jobs. And my wife and I, uh, we're almost empty nesters. All the kids are grown. They're all self-sufficient, kind of. Um, <laughs> you know, they're never around. I think I'm on my second honeymoon. I, I'm, I'm enjoying it immensely. And we're looking forward to growing old together. You know, but sometimes you can get so focused on that. And then I read my Bible, and it's like, oh my goodness, you know. I don't really measure up to... I'm reading about... I'm in Acts right now, reading Paul. It's my personal devotions. Examining Paul's life and thinking, oh my goodness, here was a single-minded man just zeroed in on what life was about. <laughs> Preaching Jesus, reaching people uh, that snatched them from the fires of hell and offering up himself a living sacrifice. And I feel like I fall so short of that. And so I'm examining myself, all right? And uh, as uh, now in the past, as I mentioned in my Sunday school lesson, you know, there was a time I thought, you know, I got this all figured out. And when I would read something like this, uh, being saved from a Roman Catholic background, and this would be part of my message too, I guess I would say this, is uh, at that time, years ago, I would say, wow, speaking about Roman Catholics there, that's who that is. And the Roman Catholics are probably saying, speaking about Protestants there, they left in one true church. And somebody else saying, oh, those are charismatics or, or whatever, you know, always picking this group or that group. 
You know, no, I, I don't. I don't think like that anymore. And like I said, when I got saved, I mean, I never read this Bible, and that's how I got saved. Sitting at home reading the Bible, and it was in this chapter when I got to the end of that chapter where it talked about the foolish man who built his house upon the rock and the a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. I thought, that's me, that foolish man. And I'm headed for hell. And I got down on my knees right there in my living room on February 3rd, 1991, and I asked the Lord Jesus to save me from hell and to help me be the best Christian I could possibly be and get off my knees. And I, I knew I was saved. I was born again. And a dramatic change came over my life. But it's still now, you know, 20, uh, 28 and a half years later, I look at a verse like that and I think, man, you know, I hope I'm not in for some surprise. But no, I, I know I'm saved. I know the great change has taken over in my life. But I also want to take heed lest I should stumble and fall. I want to be close to the Lord. I want to do the Lord's will. And I want to keep it simple, too. And so, here, let's just examine these, uh, this verse. And, and first of all, I think we could safely say that, yes, indeed, these people would have called themselves believers, as I would have before I was saved. If you would have asked me what I said, you know, I believe in Jesus Christ. And I had some good things implanted in me in the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, I remember when I was uh, first married and working at a job, a Jehovah Witness guy came up, and I didn't know nothing about Jehovah Witness. Anybody that had, like, looked religious and had religious material on them, man, I gave them respect because I wasn't living that kind of life. I, w I knew I was living a wicked life, but I would have said, hey, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. I would have said that. I would have gladly said that. Um, and this guy invited me to the Kingdom Hall, and I was all set, ready to go. And then he said, hey, are you on for tomorrow? I guess they met on Saturdays. And I said, yeah, I'm on for tomorrow. And me and my wife at, at that time, like we're saying, we were living, uh, you know, not, a, not the greatest lifestyle. And there were some shaky times there. And I said, I know what I need in my life is, uh, and it would help my marriage tremendously, is to have Jesus Christ in my life. And he said, oh, i got to warn you about something. We don't quite believe like you probably have been taught all your life about Jesus Christ. So, well, what do you mean? He says, well, we don't believe that he was uh, God in the flesh. I said, what? He said, yeah, we don't believe that. Believe that. And I said, uh, hey, listen, pal. And then I kind of got a little feisty and I said, I don't know a whole lot about the Bible, but this thing I do know, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. And if you don't believe that, I want nothing to do with your church. And I walked away. Amen. Next day he came up and he just said, come up with a book. You know, like, I like that. You know what? Hey, this is the only book you really need to know about God, all right? He comes up with some little book, the orange book. I could still remember it. He says, here, just, just read that. You know, like, that's going to solve all your, all your problems and convince you. And as he walked away, I looked at it. And something about casting doubt on the deity of Christ. Garbage can was right there. And I went, <laughs> dropped it in there <laughs> right where it belongs in the trash bin so you know what everybody's always kind of looking at each other but I'm just looking at myself here but let's look at what, what they're saying here um, they're what they're not doing he says many will come to me in that day oh, oh wait let's look at the previous uh, verse uh, number 21 it says at the end of that, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And also, we see, too, that these are workers of iniquity. Okay? They're workers of iniquity. Now, in their eyes, they're doing many wonderful things. But the Lord calls them workers of iniquity. Now, I'm not one to go to the Greek right away and all that stuff, but it is kind of interesting that that word iniquity does mean lawlessness, okay? And so these people obviously, and I think you can see that in the day and age that we are in, is that uh, uh, many people are a law unto themselves. And we even see that in our own Christian circles. I mean, I have. I mean, there are times, and well, I'm 
for better or worse, I mean, <laughs> the pastor can relate to me on this, even in our own little group, we've suffered uh, things that are like so unchrist like by others who should be Christ like. You're thinking, my goodness, how can anybody that calls himself a Christian act that way? Not that, you know, like I'm saying, there are many out there that really aren't doing things that they should be doing. And I would include myself in that. I think the apple don't fall too far from the tree sometimes from the way you behave and, and from what's coming down from the pulpit. And I think you guys are, here, are getting excellent uh, Bible preaching and, and teaching on living a godly life. But that's not the case in all, all places, like we're mentioning about some people you see on the YouTube or something, these guys just not being the most godliest of people. But hey, we are saved by grace, for by grace are you saved. And this is a favorite verse of, uh, verses of uh, Independent Fundamental Baptist. I, I, I knew it by heart when I immediately got saved and was out soul winning. For by grace are you saved, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, here's the one that we can always kind of leave out, but it's very important. For, this is Second Corinthians, Second, uh, I mean, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, Okay, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, so verse number 10 is not an option. <laughs> That's the whole purpose of us being saved, is that we are to walk in good works. We are to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he says. Look down uh, at verse number 4. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them. Okay? So, we are to do, again, what the Lord says. I'm just a firm disbeliever in easy believism. You know, when I got saved, a change came about my, about my life. Therefore, you are a new creature. Old things are passed away. And I want to keep it that way. I don't want to fall, like I said, into indifference or apathy. I want to end this race stronger than when I began. More mature. More of a perfect Christian. And so, there is what I believe, and I, I, I like to think it's kind of simple, and it's biblical, that there is a law of Christ we see uh, in Galatians chapter 6 uh, verse number 2 it says bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ no we're not under the Mosaic law but there are as it says in Hebrews chapter um, I think it's uh, 5 verse uh, 8 9 that uh, being, it says of Jesus and being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him Again, Jesus Christ says, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I said? So we see that a true Bible-believing Christian, or one who is born again, it, it distinguishes himself from these who are calling Jesus Lord in the fact that they are doing what Jesus would tell them to do. Okay? So that would be number one is that true believers do what Jesus says. And number two, I would go into this and say that, you know, we, you hear, I remember when I was first saved, I, I really don't hear about it much more, and thankfully, you know, a lot of preachers that I know are kind of speaking out on this. Is, I mean, but when I first was uh, saved, I, I was astonished one time, I was at a function, and uh, mentioning something, and this one guy said, uh, well, it was Chick Tracks. And he says, yeah, I kind of like those things before, except for that little thing at the end. And I said, well, what would that be? Well, that tells you to call up and make Jesus Lord of your life. I'm like, and you got a problem with that? Oh, that's Lordship Salvation. That's a heresy. Thinking, really? And, well, I tell you what, that, I worship my, what, what Paul say, I worship my uh, God and 
the way of my, what they, my fathers would call heresy or whatever. Hey, all I know is this, is that Paul, when he was on the road to Damascus, he asked, Lord, who art thou? And then when Jesus identified himself, he said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? <laughs> so number one, he's calling him Lord. And number two, he wants to know what he has to do. And I assume that, and I know, in fact, from his writings, that he obeyed what God wanted him to do. Ah, you know what? You kind of think about that, too. When he talked to Ananias, he says, I have separated him for uh, what? To suffer many things for my name's sake. <laughs> aren't, you, aren't you glad that the Lord didn't tell you what you need to do? <laughs> and I, you know what? Sometimes, and this is what I'm saying, I'm kind of like really on an introspective journey in my older age here, examining myself. You know what? Uh, I got to be a little, uh, what do they call that, transparent with the, uh, the other day I started thinking, that movie, It's a Wonderful Life, and I know you Tucker guys must know it because it's black and white. <laughs> it's not in color, at least not yet. And uh, actually it's one of the few movies I don't mind watching again. Not that I watch a lot of movies, in fact, I don't hardly watch any anymore, but I thought of my life like, man, I kind of have a lot in common with George Bailey, you know. Got a beautiful wife that was smitten with me and got me to marry her. Uh, we had kids. Uh, I had dreams and aspirations like him. But I was in a job I really didn't want to do my life. And I've never tried to kill myself, but there were dark moments where I thought, man, I'd be better off dead, I think, with that, you know? <laughs> One time my wife uh, wanted to have our insurance and see how, how uh, our insurance was, because we had young kids, bless you, my dear. And uh, the insurance guy says, you're worth more dead than alive, Elmer. <laughs> oh, wow, thanks, you know? Um, but what happened? I mean, upon further examination into my life, and with the kids being gone, and now I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe God didn't ever really want me to do all these things that I thought I wanted to do, and maybe I should be focused more on that gal there. And so you start focusing on your wife and trying to do just these little things in the Bible. And it dawned on me, it's almost as if the Lord said to me what that old fictional Clarence the Angel told uh, George Bailey near the end of the movie. You know, George, you really had a wonderful life. And I thought about that. It's like, man, you know, I really did have a wonderful life. All, all those things that he could have said in that movie, actually, I could say the same. Again, uh, and as we're growing older, and I'm looking and examining myself, and I'm looking at what Christ would want, what, what is it that Christ would want you to do? Well, and, and we see that they obey him, but look at what um, it says here that, how he ends the Sermon on the Mount, and I had it here in my notes, but where is it? Well, anyhow, he says this. So, um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's, it's in there in chapter um, 7. It's how he ends the Sermon on the Mount. And we see here, he says, and that, is the, that, that there is the law and the prophets, okay? And we see that over and over again in the Bible where uh, uh, a scribe came to try to trap Jesus. And he says, hey, what are the, the greatest commandments? And, 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 uh, and I love how the Lord answers them with a question. Well, what saith the law? How does thou read it? You know, how do you see it? And he said, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind and all thy soul and to love thy neighbor as thyself. He said, Thou hast rightly said, do that and you have eternal life. 
And that, and Jesus said that, on, all, on those two verses, hang all the law and the prophets. But here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he leaves that out about loving the Lord your God of all your heart. He, he just says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And, and uh, that is the law and the prophets. Okay? And so, these are workers of iniquity, and I think these are the things they may, they're very well leaving out. And they're, uh, they're not saved, in their mind, they're doing wonderful religious works, but they're not loving their neighbor with all their heart, and, and you, or with all the, as themselves. And, you know, furthermore, now let's get this straight. We're, like I said, we're saved by grace, but to be a Christian is to be Christ-like. That is what we are striving to do. And I think a lot of us feel overwhelmed with that because when we think of Jesus, we think of perfection. And that is, we're never going to be uh, perfect, but as Christ submitted to God and obeyed his commandments and loved people as a model to, uh, to do, so we too, to be Christ-like, means to operate with that same heart and intent as Jesus, even if we can't do it perfectly, in which we are not. That is to be continuously be what we are striving for. And, and we are to love our neighbors ourselves. And you know what? I mean, the Lord placed it. Uh, you know, you would think, 32 years of marriage. I've been married to this gal for 32 years. You know what? How about starting with her, you know, <laughs> as a neighbor? You know, loving her as I want her to love me. And I got to tell you, son, it's been downright fun. Um, just over the past few weeks, you know, things that God has shown me. My morning routine usually starts with a nice glass of water, wake up, sit down, and read that wa read the uh, Bible as I drink my water, then pray, then do a five-minute exercise routine before I go off to work. And recently I've been, and you would think, after all these years, but no, just recently, as my wife is getting prepared for her to go off to work, I go upstairs and we embrace and we have a word of prayer together. And that's just wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Wonderful way to start your day. I encourage you to do so if you're not doing so. But, I don't know, a couple, about a week ago or so, she got me in. Not that she was wrong. And for those of you who are newlyweds and, you know, all of us guys, you know the wife is never wrong. It's always you. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> and uh, I just got mixed up in the head that day, and I thought, you know, I had good reason to be mad. And as I sat there with my glass of water and approached my easy chair where my Bible sat to read, I thought, I don't want to read the Bible. But I sat down and I read the Bible. And that kind of softened my heart. And then as I got down to get on my knees and pray, I thought, oh, I really don't feel like praying, man. I'm kind of mad at my wife. But I got down and I prayed. And God spoke to my heart and said, Boy, I forgave you for a lot of things. Yeah, sure have. I don't even know why I was mad about her. And you know what? The more you do it, the better it gets. You know, you just, this is what, it's simple. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, for Christ's sake, as he has forgiven us. I, I may have butchered the end of that, but you get the message. That's what God wants from us. That's what we're to be. And man, that was like, that's, that's simple. I mean, it's not always easy to put in practice, but just like any other, just like a physical exercise, and, and this is what the Bible tells us to do. It says, work out your salvation. Not work for your salvation, but work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah. You know, I got me thinking, yes, Lord, you've forgiven me for much. So, like I said, I don't, I don't know what I may have been miffed about. But you know what? When I got upstairs and we embraced and we prayed together, I totally forgot about it. And, and so we're to do that. 
to those who come across the, our path. I, I hate to use personal illustrations a lot, but let me allow you to use my wife as our neighbors. I mean, I want to be a beacon of light in my neighborhood, but if I, I can go and preach the gospel, I can, sh I can even do it in a nice way, but if I'm, though, once I do that, those people are going to be looking at me. You know, what do they want to see? Is he living it out? You know, a preacher once said this, if you went into a bar and asked them how a Christian should act, they would tell you. They, a lost person has high expectations for a, a person who says they're a follower and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. I mean, do you not believe that? Lost people want to, they think you should be living a godly life. So, uh, in our neighborhood, I, I remember when we first moved in, there was a family across the street, kind of living the way we used to when we weren't saved. A lot of parties going on there, teenage kids. Mom was kind of oblivious. Their husband had passed away. And uh, my wife, seen her, was behind her in March. And she had a whole cart full of groceries, put them up there, rang them up, and we only accept checks. Back then, they only accept checks. She's like, oh, man. Now, she either forgot or she wasn't aware. Regardless. My wife says, she had talked to her, hey, I'm your neighbor across the street and all this, and blah, blah, blah. She didn't have a check. She had all these groceries out there. My wife says, hey, what is it? I'll write it out for you and you can pay me back when you get home. Would you do that? Sure, why not? She got home, she told me what she did. I was like, oh, that's nice. Hope she pays you back. <laughs> you know? I, mean, I thought, man, there's a little fear and trepidation going on here, you know. I mean, how, how much was the check for? And it was, I think it was over like 200 bucks. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Uh, uh, that was a leap of faith there, you know. Hope she, hope she pays you back. How long ago was this anyhow, you know? <laughs> and uh, you know, here come the lady coming from Mosey across the street. And she wrote her out a check for that amount. And, man, thanks a lot, you know. <laughs> and she was highly impressed. My wife never told her she was a Christian. Not during that time. We were able to invite her to church. And I would say this, my wife has invited more people to church in my neighborhood than I have because we just strive to be neighborly. I'll say this much every morning when I get down on my knees and pray, I pray for each and every neighbor that I know by name, which one, I believe with all my heart, God is going to bless. But two, it helps me remember their name. <laughs> there are people I've met one time and I said, uh, okay, that's Bridget. She's five houses down, but that's Bridget. She's a single gal. I'm going to pray for Bridget that God would watch over and protect her and keep her. Next time I came into Bridget, I mentioned her name. She goes, how do you know my name? I said, well, I mean, you introduced me. Said, Man, that was about five years ago. I forgot your name, you know. I, mean, I was like, yeah. And I, so I pray, and I tell them that. I love to do that. It's because I pray for you every morning, Bridget. It's like, really? You're praying for me? It's like, wow. You know, so God is blessed. I'll tell you, here we are in Cleveland, Ohio. A lot of people might think, oh, that's a bad neighborhood. Not our neighborhood. I, I tell you, God seems to have blessed it tremendously. I mean, the neighbors uh, on one side of us, a guy is just, uh, he moved in there. We tried to be neighborly. This guy's invited us over for family fun functions and all that. He now comes to our church. Uh, the, the kid on the other side of us, I mean, it was rough at the get-go. They had the rock band and all that. Oh, those, those were some trying times. But... Uh, Wife is gone. The kid's there by himself. Heck, we spent the day yesterday with the kid riding around Amish country, you know, and he just had a grand old time. First time he's ever been down there. Uh, and all on the street. Uh, one time we were out in visitation, you know, and people knew me. The pastor was like, man, everybody knows you around here. It's like, yeah, we try to be neighborly, you know. <laughs> And that's what I would say. Keep it simple. That's what the Lord wants you to do. You know, love your neighbor with all your heart. Uh, be a, make yourself uh, self available to them. And that's, that's what's being Christ-like. You know, uh, there's another chapter that I, you know, don't fully understand it. But when you get into Matthew chapter 25 and he separates the sheep from, uh, sheep from the goats. You know, what does he tell those? You know, both groups, you know. 
when I want when I ask for a cup of water to the to the sheep, he says, "You gave me to drink when I needed to drink." He said, "Lord, when did you do that? When? When you de did it to one of the least of my brethren, he did it also unto me." Boy, if you haven't read it, a book I highly recommend is Andrew Mur Murray's book on humility. And I remember hearing preachers, and I've heard several preachers say this, well, the moment you realize you're being humble, you're no longer being humble. And I thought, well, that's nonsense. Why would God put such emphasis on a holy characteristic that he himself embodies and is the author of that you couldn't know how to do, and once you did know you were doing it, you were no longer doing it. That just sounds ridiculous. Now, I would agree that if you take pride in your humility, that no, you are not humble. You, you missed the point, you know. But, Andrew Murray states it this way. When you treat somebody that is the least of all, in the manner in which you would treat the Lord Jesus Christ himself, that is humility. Isn't that simple? I mean, doesn't the, uh, James say that? If you say to somebody who is rich, hey, sit here and have the chief speak, seat, but say to some beggarly person, eh, just sit there underneath my footstool, you're not being humble. But if you treat people, if you're not a respecter of persons, and you treat those that you know, are the least of the brother, if, if you could even say such a thing, but the Bible, Jesus does put it that way, uh, in a godly fashion, then you're being humble. And so that there, we'll conclude my message on, on, that, on that thing there, that I would just say, hey, keep it simple. <laughs> do what the Lord wants you to do. I mean, be kind, be ye kind. I love that verse, be ye kind. That's simple, right? Be kind. Be tender-hearted. I, I find that, you know, early in the morning, sometimes I can be tender-hearted. You start getting in that day, and you can start getting uh, and hard and hard and hard. It gets harder and harder. And be forgiving. Those three things. And uh, I think the Lord would be pleased. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this day, this opportunity once again. Please, Lord, help us to be ever mindful, yes, of the simplicity in Christ, but also of our uh, just indifference on, uh, at times and just our neglect and being caught up in cares of this world, Lord, that we often just overlook the very simple things that really please you. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. I pray, dear God, you'd keep us from that. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you.